Congressman, stand by for one moment because sure. we're seeing President Please Trump here and the seated. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin uh, approaching the lecterns. We're going to hear from them any second. Let's listen in. Mr. President, Madam First Lady, I hope that you enjoyed your time. I appreciate the opportunity to learn about your thoughts and vision. I believe that the unbreakable bond between us, along with your determination, will open up new possibilities for the State of Israel and the entire region. Mr. President, we are happy to see that America is back in the area. America is back again. You marked the defeating of ISIS as one of your top missions. This is most important objective. Israel will do everything in its power in order to assist you in this mission. Israel appreciates America's leadership under your administration in the action you, look, you took in Syria. There are red lines, as it happened in Syria, that must never be crossed. There is a price that must be paid by those who violate the most basic values that makes us human. Further action must be considered in face of the horrors that, that is still taking place on the other side of our border. Mr. President, the Jewish people return to the historic homeland after 2,000 years of exile. We created a miracle, a, a technological miracle, an economical miracle, a human miracle. And even during our most difficult times, we never gave up on our dream of living here in peace with our neighbors. We reached a peace agreement with our neighbors in Jordan and with our neighbors in Egypt. But we have not yet achieved our mission of living in peace with our neighbors, the Palestinians, and with the rest of the Arab world. Our destiny, Palestinians and Jews, is to live together in this land, Mr. President. We must build trust and cooperation between us. But in order to achieve this, we need new ideas, new energy that will help us move forward together. We can have here an oasis, an international center of tourism, a startup land, Silicon Valley, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. But we must be sure that we don't go to sleep with a dream and wake up with a nightmare, with Iran, ISIS, and Hamas in our borders. In order to dream, we need to be sure that Iran is out, out of our borders, out of Syria, out of Lebanon. I welcome you and I welcome your willingness to help us move forward. We want to move forward. Mr. President, we want to move forward. And we must do it together, together with America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And shalom. I'm honored to be in the great state of Israel, the homeland of the Jewish people, I'm awed by the beauty and majesty of this sacred and very holy land. President Rivlin, Mrs. Rivlin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for opening your wonderful home and welcoming Melania and myself to your amazing country. And that's what it is. It is an amazing country. What you've done is perhaps has virtually never been done before. 
On my first trip overseas, I've come to this ancient land to reaffirm the enduring friendship between the United States and the State of Israel. And it will always be enduring. And that's number one to me. We are not only longtime friends, we are great allies and partners. We stand together always. This moment in history calls for us to strengthen our cooperation as both Israel and America face common threats from ISIS and other terrorist groups to countries like Iran that sponsor terrorism and fund and foment terrible violence, not only here, but all over the world. Together, we can work to end the scourge of violence that has taken so many lives here in Israel and around the world. Most importantly, the United States and Israel can declare with one voice that Iran must never be allowed to possess a nuclear weapon, never, ever, and must cease its deadly funding, training, and equipping of terrorists and militias. And it must cease immediately. On those issues, there is a strong consensus among the nations of the world including many in the Muslim world. I was deeply encouraged by my conversations with Muslim world leaders in Saudi Arabia, including King Solomon, who I spoke to at great length. King Solomon feels very strongly, and I can tell you would love to see peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Many expressed their resolve to help end terrorism and the spread of radicalization. Many Muslim nations have already taken steps to begin following through on this commitment. There is a growing realization among your Arab neighbors that they have common cause with you and the threat posed by Iran. And it is indeed a threat. There is no question about that. I thank both you and Prime Minister Netanyahu for your commitment to achieving peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I also look forward to discussing the peace process with Palestinian President Abbas. Young Israeli and Palestinian children deserve to grow up in safety and to follow their dreams free from the violence that has destroyed so many lives. The United States and Israel can also bring safety and greater prosperity to our people through stronger ties of trade and commerce. Already, our two countries do a great deal of business together. We have a strong foundation on which to build an even closer trading relationship that benefits both of our countries. I'm going to try and narrow that trade deficit just a little bit. Is that okay? Huh? <laughs> he doesn't mind. He wants to keep it the way it is. I understand. <laughs> Today, we have so many incredible opportunities before us. And my hope for this visit is that we seize every single one of them. I am thrilled to be here on behalf of the American people. I know Israel and America share the same goals, and I have great confidence that we can achieve tremendous success together. We can achieve all of our goals together. President Rivlin, I look forward to working with you and to seeing more of the sacred land and getting to spend time with the remarkable people of Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, you've been listening there to President Trump speaking with Israel's President Rivlin there in these prepared remarks. We have a copy of these pre prepared remarks, so we were able to follow along and see the, uh, you know, truly historic things that President Trump is bringing with him to Israel and saying, and the new policies that he wants to establish in terms of a relationship with Israel. So let's bring in our panel to discuss it all. We have CNN White House correspondent Sarah Murray. She is live in Jerusalem. We have CNN political analyst David Gregory, CNN global affairs analyst Tony Blinken, and adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, Farah 
Pandeep. It's great to have all of you with all of your perspectives. David Gregory, uh, just tell us what you heard there. Well, I think there's a couple of really significant things that we should address this morning. Number one, the fact that President Trump is making Israel and the Middle East such a priority so early in his administration represents a major shift. And in this case, with regard to the relationship with Israel, this shift is toward Israel's way of thinking about national security. Is it a shift toward not only Israel, but to Sunni states uh, who consider Iran an enemy? And it is a marked contrast from the work of the Obama administration, which sought to negotiate and did negotiate with Iran a nuclear deal that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu opposed at every possible turn. And Trump agrees with that, even though he has kept the, uh, the agreement in place. He is coming out here this morning with the Israeli president saying that Iran cannot have a nuclear weapon. So I think strategically the president is signaling to Israel and to Sunni uh, allies in the Middle East that there is a different emphasis in terms of national security and America's foreign policy that's much more in line with the thinking of the Israeli prime minister. It, it, it harkens back to me to the immediate 9-11, post 9-11 period uh, when the Bush administration got very close to, to the administration of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. We're watching a, a tree dedication. They planted a tree in honor of President Donald Trump right there. Obviously, uh, when you plant trees in Israel, it's even greater significance. The planting of trees and, and uh, making the desert green over the last hundred years is something that's been very important to the Israeli people. Now, President Donald Trump has a tree of his own uh, in the Holy Land. Tony Blinken, David Gregory brought up the issue of Iran. And in fact, the president's remarks with Reuven Rivlin, the Israeli president, were very brief. And within those very brief remarks, the focus on Iran was notable and disproportionate. He said the United States and Israel can declare with one voice that Iran must never be allowed to possess a nuclear weapon, must cease its deadly funding, training, equipping of terrorists and militias. If there is one message, that one thread uh, of the president's visit so far, whether it be to Saudi Arabia, his speech to the Sunni leaders uh, in this stop in Israel, it is making Iran the common enemy. John, you know, you're exactly right, and this is the common denominator that the president's trying to find, both with the uh, uh, Arab states and with Israel. Uh, it's ironic because he really dug into that line about Iran never getting a nuclear weapon, and of course the nuclear agreement reached by President Obama <laughs> is exactly, uh, exactly that. Uh, and it's an agreement that uh, President Trump has, has maligned, but it does more than anything we've been able to do to put far into the future the prospect of Iran getting enough material for a nuclear weapon. Uh, so hopefully he'll sustain that agreement. Um, everyone is united around that principle, and there's a lot uh, to be done to push back against uh, Iran's objectionable activities, whether it's support for terrorism, whether it's destabilizing activities in various countries. But there's a danger of over-calibrating and, and over-correcting on this. Uh, Iran just had a remarkable election, and despite all of the uh, manifest imperfections of that election in the system, nonetheless, the candidate who is the most pragmatic, the one who wants to open Iran to the world, uh, and if he's going to do that, uh, to behave a little bit more responsibly around the world. Rouhani won a resounding victory. Uh, there's change in Iran. There's demographic change. There's societal change. Young people want to be connected to the world. We have to walk a very fine line between, on the one hand, making sure we are pushing back against uh, Iran's objectionable activities, but not closing the door uh, on a relationship as this country evolves, because that will only reinforce all of the hardliners in the country who want to keep Iran stuck in the past. That's the line the president has to walk. And it's difficult to do that if uh, you're actually putting all of your focus uh, on bringing people together in this crusade uh, against, uh, against Iran. Well, there you go. I mean, Farah, that's exactly, it seems as though it's very clear which side of the line President Trump is on. I mean, in his speech, he just said, there is a growing realization among your Arab neighbors, he told Israel, that they have common cause with you in the threat posed by Iran. And as Tony says, this moment is an interesting and ironic time to say that because here is this more moderate, more modern President Rouhani who's just been elected. So what's the, what's the calculus here? 
You know, I think you have to put these two speeches side by side, what he said yesterday in Saudi Arabia and what he said today in Israel. Each of these speeches are careful, they're measured, they're calculated, and they're very sensitive to the audiences that he's speaking to. And I, and I, I think you need to connect it in that way. Yesterday, when the president spoke to the room of more than 50 leaders from Muslim-majority nations, he was very specifically speaking about the ideology that underpins extremism. And I think that was really important for us uh, to hear, both in the room and here in America. But backing up that kind of proclamation, that he finds it very important that we debunk the narratives of the extremists. He talked about wanting to learn lessons of the uh, extremism. And he also talked about the need to have Muslim voices uh, speak out uh, against the terrorist organizations. Connects very nicely to what he's trying to do on the speech. Today, as he just delivered this speech about uh, how he looked at the region, my thought was really about how it is, the words that he's saying, obviously, are speaking to a, a not just uh, Israel, but it's speaking to the, the global population of where this administration is positioning itself around all these issues. And I would like to see uh, a change in the credibility gap that he has uh, right now when he's speaking to Muslims around the world to do more to fight extremism. This president needs to follow up his words with action. And if he is learning from the issues of extremism over the course of the last 15 years, as he said in his speech yesterday, we need to see both here at home and abroad, uh, the the change in sentiment around the, the, the push of hate speech that's gone forward, a debunking of this idea that we can have an us and them, and most particularly, Allison, uh, when he gave this speech in Saudi Arabia, I'd like to see him make a deal with the Saudis that's good for America, which means the stop, uh, stop the incitement there of hate. Go. And anti-Semitism is very much a part of that. We just saw the motorcade leave. Uh, they are now headed to the old city uh, of Jerusalem. And Sarah Murray, uh, White House correspondent who is with us as well, Farrah was just saying that so far the remarks have been careful and deliberate. This next part of the president's itinerary is risky in a way, risky in the sense that he is visiting sites that no sitting U.S. president, Sarah, has ever visited before. Yes, and, and it's going to be interesting to see how... Uh, That's right, and there's a reason for that. Uh, Go ahead, Sarah Murray. Yeah, I mean, he, he's visiting more sensitive territory. His first stop, we're expecting to be uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is a very holy site in Christianity, perhaps the holiest site. And then after that, the Western Wall, which is you were pointing out an American president has never visited before as a sitting president. Um, it's an area of contention as to whether it is in Israel. Uh, that's something we saw the president's advisors stumble over in the weeks leading up to this trip, saying only that the Western Wall is in Jerusalem. We know that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wanted to accompany President Trump uh, on the, his visit to the wall, and uh, advisors to the president sort of let that go by. They wanted it to be more of a religious trip. They didn't want to use it to make a political statement. But as you can see just by that, uh, it's certainly going to be a visit that's fraught. Now, after he leaves the Western Wall, he will be meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. They're also supposed to dine this evening with the First Lady and the Prime Minister's wife. Um, but I think what you saw sort of earlier from the president in his prepared remarks is laying the groundwork for trying to move forward with a Mideast peace deal. I imagine he's going to take sort of a similar tone tomorrow when he meets with President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority. And David Gregory, I mean, we just can't overstate the significance of these images that we're about to see of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Wailing Wall and the president visiting that and all that that all the message and weight that that contains politically and more importantly, religiously, you know, uh, I covered President Bush, whose trip to the Holy Land was made very much, as he said at the time, as a pilgrim. And this is a pilgrimage for President Trump as well, because uh, it is politically fraught. He's not going there with the Israeli prime minister. He's not trying to trample upon what is official U.S. policy, which is not to uh, talk about Jerusalem uh, being owned by Israel or part of Israel because uh, it is in dispute. But there is a timing and a religious issue. So the timing is that this is in Hebrew, uh, Yom Yerushalayim, which is the 50th anniversary of 
the reunification of Jerusalem. It's on the Hebrew calendar. And so it marks the time when Israeli forces uh, recaptured uh, the Western Wall, which is the westernmost wall of the sec Second Temple, where ancient Jews would go to offer sacrifice and to pray, and where the high priests in Judaism would enter into the Holy of the Holies uh, for a, a se official sacramental reasons. That was destroyed. The Jews were exiled into Babylon, and then ultimately the Second Temple was destroyed later by the Romans. So the religious significance of this is that this is the heartbeat of Judaism in the world. Uh, Jews pray at the wall, but we pray toward Jerusalem. We pray about Jerusalem. In the Psalms, Psalms 137 talks about Jews in exile, saying that if we should ever forget you, Jerusalem, should my right hand wither. So it's so important religiously, and it sends a very powerful message to Jews around the world but also to evangelical Christians who are an important part of the president's base, for whom unity and reunification of Jerusalem is very important to them religiously as well as Christians. And of course, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus is said to have been crucified, only underscores why Jerusalem is an ancient and a holy city, uh, mm -hmm. con a contested city, uh, because of those uh, holy sites. And the president is wading into all of that uh, to send a very powerful message. And just the political point, to go to the Western Wall uh, is to suggest the importance of the Jewish character of Jerusalem, the importance of Jerusalem to Israel. That's a very powerful message uh, to the Israeli state. You know, and we should overlook the fact that the walk from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is about 10 minutes to the Western Wall. Um, 10 minutes, you know, 500 meters, you know, on top of the Western Wall, the Alaska Mosque. Uh, obviously, the third holiest site in all of Islam. The proximity of all these sites help explain why there is such a contest in that region. Tony Blinken, as you're looking at live pictures right now inside the old city as they await uh, for the president's arrival, your final thoughts here. Look, I, I think the president's right to plunge into this, and it's fraught with peril. Past presidents have tried and failed, but he's right to, to try and to invest the United States in this effort uh, to bring peace. But we shouldn't expect any quick, uh, quick results from this. The parties are so incredibly divided. The gulf between them is huge on the final status issues, particularly on borders, on security, on refugees, on Jerusalem. But I think what the president's trying to do is show that he understands Israel, that he understands the history, to build confidence with them. Because at the end of the day, the Israelis are going to have to take real risks for peace. Uh, he's going to have to convince them to do that. And then he's going to have to find a coherent Palestinian partner uh, for the Israelis to deal with. None of that's going to be easy. But if you can get people talking again, uh, that's certainly better than the alternative. Uh, and the president's right to put the focus on that. Panel. Can I raise w yeah, one other quickly point qu quickly? It's also, talk about being fraught. The president's going to the part of the Western Wall where only men can pray. There is another side where women are allowed to pray. Uh, and women have been challenging that within the reform movement of Judaism. They've been challenging that. They thought they had a deal for women to be able to access a critical part of the Western Wall. That deal has fallen apart. So even that piece of it, the president is walking into going to a part of the wall, and this is very controversial among Jews, that only men can go pray where the president will uh, insert a note today. Thank you, panel, for all of that perspective. It is very important to keep all of this in mind as we watch the unfolding events there in Israel. So we will have much more on President Trump's visit, this historic visit to Jerusalem. He and the First Lady are heading to the Old City, as we've been speaking about. He will visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, as well as the Western Wall. So we will bring all of that to you live. And of course, this is a chance for the president to refocus uh, from what has been real problems here in the United States, where he cannot shake the Russia investigation. Fired FBI Director James Comey expected to testify maybe one week from now. We'll speak with former CIA and NSA Director Michael Hayden about the fallout next.